Well, good morning. If you'll stand and join us as we sing our theme song, it's good to see you this morning. Let's have a good time in the Lord this morning. We stand here together as a family. We join hands together, giving praises to the Father above for sending his Son. We've chosen together. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're so glad you're here. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's see. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing along with us. If you don't, just watch us. Just worship the Lord. <laughs> what it's about. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. 
I love this song. You know it, sing along. <laughs> if you don't, just watch us. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. It says, Who on Lord could save themselves? Their own so they could. Our shame was deeper than the sea, but your grace is deeper still. It's called You Alone Can Rescue. Who Lord could save themselves? their own soul could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise you O Lord have made a way the great divide you heal for when our hearts were time we have to come into your house, Lord, to worship, to sing praises to you, to lift your name up, Lord, but most importantly, to hear your word, and Lord, we pray that you would be with those that are out, those that are sick, those that couldn't be here for one reason or another, those that are watching on Facebook, Lord, we pray that something that was sung today or something that can be said, preached, Lord, will touch their heart, and Lord, if someone doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Leave today before coming to know you. Lord, just thank you for everything you're going to do. Be with the speaker today. Lord, just um, use him. Lord, speak through him. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Family Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here this morning. And in the house of the Lord, no greater place to be right now than to worship him in the house of the Lord. Thank you for those who are here and uh, coming out to be a part of this morning service. to be a special service. I'm excited about uh, today's uh, today's service. We have a special speaker with us here today, Brother Clint Fredericks. His family is here. Uh, they came down just to be with us. The beach had nothing to do with it. <laughs> or their kids. Two of their kids live down here.
with, um, and help me out before I say all this wrong. Tiffany, it was your art show. Art show. She's an, are you an artist or a graphic designer? Is it the same thing, really? <laughs> your sister's saying no. No. All right. Uh, but no, came down for that. And of course, the beach as well. Friends, thank you all for being here as well. That whole crew over there. Uh, but when I heard they were coming down, I asked for the Freds, hey, would you mind preaching for us? I love hearing Brother Freds preach. And uh, as you, if those of you don't, don't know, uh, Brother Fredericks was my speech one, speech two, and something else. Oh, uh, philosophy, educa- or philosophy of uh, youth work one, youth work two, uh, teacher back in church. So basically, if, if I traumatize your kids, it's his fault. If I speak poorly up here, it's also his fault. So uh, <laughs> if you've ever sat through one of my sermons and thought, man, this guy's boring, uh, well, it came back my teacher. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man, no. Truth of the matter is, he was a wonderful teacher. The student might not have been so uh, so attuned to what he was saying, but uh, he was a wonderful speaker and uh, also a wonderful uh, friend and mentor in my past. And so I'm looking forward to what hearing what God has laid upon his heart today. And so that will be great. Open your bulletins. Anybody first time visiting this morning? Never been to Family Baptist Church this morning and didn't get your little blue cup? Anybody did not? All right. Okay. Everybody's good. If you open your bulletins there, we have just a few announcements we have to go over. Uh, got a busy March coming up, and I'm excited about March. Uh, we just started um, two weeks ago our discipleship classes. Uh, so if you are wanting to be a part of those discipleship classes, for the Brad, what is the discipleship class? Well, uh, beginning of the year when we had our vision service talking about teaching them diligently out of Deuteronomy, we said that we were going to start this year doing a 15-week class uh, that goes through the whole aspects of the Bible and discipleship. And I ask everyone who comes to Family Baptist Church to consider doing one of those 15-week courses on Sunday night. There are some who ask, can I come to all of them? Sure, you can come all year if you'd like and hear it three times over. Uh, But I'm asking you just to come once to one of those classes to get a good base of what the Bible has to say uh, and as well as how we are to teach other Christians also. We said in our vision service that it's our job as Christians to teach. We're either teaching those things of the Bible or we're teaching those things of the flesh and of the world. We should, as Christians, be teaching others also about what it means to be a good Christian, especially us Christians who have been saved for years and years. It's our job not to retire or just to sit, but to teach others also. That's what that class is about. That starts every night, every Sunday night at 5 p.m. So I'd love for you to come out and be a part of that class. Also, our new members class just started today. Uh, I had uh, two in there who are looking to uh, join Family Baptist Church in the future. If you're interested in joining Family Baptist Church, uh, this class is necessary for you to join. doesn't mean that when you get through the class that you are a member, but if you are interested in becoming a member in the future of Family Baptist Church, then you need to have one of these classes uh, uh, done. So uh, that's going on at 9, 9.15 on Sunday morning. So while Dad's having his Bible study at 9.15 here, we have our new, our new members class back in the conference room. Uh, it is not too late to jump in. We can jump in as, if, if you, if you want to come next week. Uh, you're totally fine coming next week, and uh, you'll be able to finish the class there. Obviously, we talked about it with the Fredericks today. Then March 14th is what we're calling Life Sunday. So if you've been with us here the past uh, month or so, we've been going over Galatians chapter 5. Uh, a sermon series entitled Walk in the Spirit, and we're talking about the concept of the, the flesh and the spirit, how they battle against each other, and that for us to live a successful Christian life and for us to have the fruits of the spirit uh, that are showing in our life, we have to yield to the spirit so that we will not walk in the flesh. Well, uh, if you've been with us, you know we're about to go into the works of the flesh and so last week we, we dealt with the first part of that. March 14th, Life Sunday, uh, is going to be all about pro-life or the issue of abortion in our country. Uh, we've never had one of these days before, but I'm really excited. You do not want to miss next week. Uh, it's going to be a really good week. We have two special guests coming in, Anna Strasburg, who is uh, her whole uh, ministry. And some of you PCC might remember her or know her. Uh, but her whole ministry is to bring light to uh, the, uh, the, the sin of abortion, what's going on in our country with abortion, and to promote the pro-life stance. Uh, she actually, uh, when she 
kicked off her ministry. She's an athlete or a runner or whatnot. But she kicked off her ministry. She started uh, from one side of the country and ran across the entire country uh, to bring light to uh, her cause. I couldn't run across my driveway without fainting. So uh, I, I have a great respect for her. So uh, she, she ran across the whole country. She has a, a documentary, a video talking about what she did. She'll be here speaking, wonderful speaker. She speaks to conferences and schools all across the nation. Her job, um, obviously, mainly is to get in front of those high school girls, those high school guys, talk to them about the issue. If we're ever going to change the direction of our spiritual state in the country, it's got to start with the kids. And so that's her main job. She'll be here with us. Also, uh, Dr. William Lyle will be here with us. He is a doctor here in Pensacola, uh, and uh, and he is his ministry is... Uh, going around. I think he even uh, for a while had a uh, pregnancy crisis center that they would take in uh, ladies who had who were uh, considering abortion and what they were going to do and show them their babies and talk them uh, towards the direction of, of life. Um, he delivered two of my children, delivered several other children here. Uh, he's just a wonderful guy. In fact, if whenever, if you remember back when uh, New York passed their, uh, their uh, pro-choice bill uh, that was, I guess that was end of 19 they did that uh you saw a a doctor who would go to the beach and he would show he would do videos about pro-life and how the government you know has these laws but we protect you know sea turtles and all that kind of stuff that video went viral over facebook that's the doctor that's going to be here with us uh he's going to give the his 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 ministry and the medical side of it and what it means so i'm excited about this coming up sunday pro-life sunday or we're calling life sunday and we're going to deal with that aspect, and that's all part of the sermon series that we're doing. That's why we set it up. We have to talk about the concept of what are the works of the flesh, what happens when man is left to himself uh, without God, without the Holy Spirit working in their lives, and then, of course, it's the whole thing's going to end with the fruits of the Spirit. Now, if a Christian is walking in the Spirit, what should a Christian look like after they're walking in the Spirit? That's the fruits of of the Spirit. So make sure that you uh, are here next Sunday for that. That'll be a great day. Also, March 20th, it's almost here, March 20th, Community Day. Uh, Brother Dave Bishop out of Heber Springs, Arkansas will be with us, and he'll set up all the inflatables, and uh, we're going to have all the events and the games and the cotton candy and the uh, snow cones and the hot dogs and all that good stuff for the community. Uh, how many of y'all saw the, uh, the advertisement on Facebook this week that we posted about that? Okay, some of y'all did. Thanks for those who shared it. Uh, you'll see a lot more coming up this week. Uh, but invite a friend to that. Last year, we had about 300 people come out to Community Today. It's a good chance for them to meet us and uh, for us to talk to them, show them the love of Christ. Obviously, the whole concept will be that they will receive an invitation to Easter Sunday just a few weeks after that. And so we'll be able to invite them, come out to Easter Sunday. Uh, so do be in prayer about that. And make sure that you have that on your calendar, March 20th. That's starting at 10 and going to 1 that Saturday. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board right now. If you're willing to help with that, we need plenty of help. If you're willing to help with that, whether it be parking or helping with the inflatables or in the kitchen, uh, sign up there, and then we'll contact you, and we'll get where you want to be and, and how you want to help. Uh, also, I announced this last week, we have secured the, the soft serve ice cream truck to come by during that event, so praise the Lord for that. I love ice cream, as you can tell, uh, but uh, no, that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited about that, and I know the kids will like that too, uh, so we'll have a good, a good time March 20th. We'll talk a lot more about that uh, next week. And then, of course, leading up to that, okay? Uh, thank you for those who continue to give to our capital campaign program, our building fund. We have a leaf to turn over, Ron, if you don't mind doing that for me. Those who don't know, uh, last year we, or earlier this year, or I'm sorry, last year, uh, we started a three-year campaign to help pay off and pay down the debt on this building. And you guys committed for three years to give to the building program, that tree back there is the representation of how many $1,000 units were given. All those leaves are $1,000 units. If they are green, that means they are committed. When they turn gold, that means they are given. So in three years, we hope to see that green tree turn into a gold tree. And, of course, remember what God has done through us in our giving. Thank you for those who do give, and remember to give towards your commitments as well. Okay? Once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, visitors, Frederick's family, and all the friends. Thank you so much for coming out and being a part of that. We're going to hear from other friends here in just a minute after the offering. Uh, but first, after the offering, uh, we're going to have two of his kids sing for us, Tim and Tab, Tabitha. So it's Tim, Tab, Tiff, right? So Tiffany, Tabitha, Tim, 
And uh, so we're hearing from, and so Tiffany, no, uh, no, no third part there, Tiffany? No, no, okay, all right. I'm looking for a trio there, but okay, all right, that's fine. We'll hear from, uh, from Tim and Tab right after the offering, guys. So just as soon as the offering's over, uh, towards the end, kind of while the offering's going, you guys can come on up. Also the musicians as well. Ushers, why don't you come forward, and we'll take up the offering this morning. Once again, thank you so much for being here and uh, giving to God as God has laid upon your heart. It's always a blessing to give. It truly is. It's always a blessing to give to God, uh, who is not only the giver of life, but everything that we have. It all belongs to Him anyway. Let's pray. We'll take up the offering. But Jimmy, why don't you play an offertory for us? And then uh, we'll look forward to hearing the special. And then I'll come back up after the special, Brother Fred's, and introduce you here this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Brother Bill, why don't you pray for us, please? One, two. Test, test. Could it be that we're so heavenly minded that somehow we've been blinded to what he's calling us to do right here? Could it be that heaven's always planned it and that we leave here empty handed when this life disappears? I don't want to waste a breath, one heartbeat in this chest. I want to see his kingdom come in. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. regret. I want to leave with nothing left. When I think of all that I've been given and what I've learned from living, I know exactly what I need to do. So I pray that God will give me chances 
to show how great his grace is by living out his truth. If somehow I could choose it, I'd be the one God uses to make a difference in what forever means to you. I don't want to waste a breath, one heartbeat in this chest. I want to see his kingdom come in. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. I don't want to leave here with regret. I want to leave with nothing left. I want to be a light, lend a hand, speak the truth to a dying man. I don't want to waste a breath, one heartbeat in this chest. I want to see his kingdom come in. I won't wish my life away. I want to live each day to give away what I've been given. I don't want to leave here with regret. No, I don't want to leave here with regret. I want to leave with nothing left. Leave with nothing left. All right, thanks, guys. I appreciate that. That was wonderful. And uh, like I said, before, do you need a lapel or are you okay with this? Okay, great. Like I said before, Brother Fred's was a teacher back in college, and, uh, and I know we had a lot of fun. Actually, uh, me and my wife met Triple S Christian Ranch 2005, 2006, summer 2006. You guys were there, weren't you? So uh, you were my boss, too, I guess, too, as well. So <laughs> teacher, boss, mentor, but uh, no, we had, we had a, a good friendship with them, and and uh, just been really great to, to have you guys kind of back in our lives now with the kids coming to college and seeing you guys. I remember, I'm, I'm going to tell one, one thing before I let you up. Oh. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, uh, talking about the, the, uh, Brother Fred, just a really good guy and, and great character. He has uh, just a good, a good there's, there's a few people in your life that you meet that truly are just good-hearted, great character people. I remember one time we were all hanging around in college, and they were talking about uh, the basketball team. Brother Fred, you coached the basketball team for four or five years? Six. Six two championships? Three, Three championships. <laughs> 500 on championships, man, I tell you, that's great. He was a wonderful coach. And I remember we were all talking about the basketball team, and, and they were talking about these people who played. And I said, Coach, would I have made the basketball team? In his graciousness, he didn't answer right away. He sat. He thought it looked just like this. No. <laughs> okay, yeah. And that was the truth. That was the truth. Yeah, he, he couldn't tell me a lie. But, uh, and uh, so I am grateful for your honesty, Brother Freds. But no, he really goes. I'm going to say this. All the classes I had about youth work, there were people that talked about this and talked about that. But all the stuff that I referenced today in my notes or referenced today in youth work, the most meaningful, the most practical, the best stuff that I ever used while I was a youth pastor did come from the Freds from college. He truly was, uh, brought it down to the bases, brought it down to the basics, taught you what to do, and was a very successful youth pastor as well. And now assistant pastor in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Rural Hall, North Carolina. So I'm excited to hear from the Freds this morning. Why don't you come on up and give us what the Lord's lay upon your heart, brother. Thank you so much. It's a delight.
gotten over yet. Uh, this was, you know, 2020 was a quote unquote, you know, stinky year for a lot of people. We hated all this, isn't that? But it was the first time in several years Brother Clint was not rushed to the emergency room. I'm like the Tim the Toolman Taylor of youth pastors where I frequent there often uh, trying to think I'm 17, 16, 15, and I definitely, my body reminds me that I am not, but still get to work with youth and uh, still get to oversee our junior church. I almost wanted to go in the back with the junior church out there and almost speak with them. I feel a little more comfortable, I think, in that realm, but uh, I saw something in the back there and I had to just bring it up here. It must be a project for the children's church or something. It says Holy Bible with construction paper and everything. And uh, Miss Megan, as I opened this up and uh, looked at it, I don't know if your kids, I don't know if it's theirs or not. I really don't. I just found it back there. Um, it says this, God so loved the world that he sent his begotten son to save us from our sins and, so ever, uh, and whosoever believes shall not perish. And then on this side, there's four words. It says, this is the way. And so I just thought this had the Mandalorian influence from the Moffat family that, uh, you know, this is the way. It, 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 let me just embarrass the parents. Is this anyone's kids that this? It's yours. Hey. I love it. It's awesome. And uh, there's a lot more truth to that. And you might reach a, a group of geeks of Star Wars fans by reminding them, this is the way. And uh, I loved it. So, uh uh, here, you may want, I don't know, there, there you go, there's a gift, thank you for being in church this morning, and glad the preacher could embarrass you, but I loved it, uh, it's so good to be back and see friends, Brother Bradley is one of two people who have given the quote-unquote open invitation, Brother Bobby, he's uh, said, if you were coming into town, and do not contact me that you're here for a Sunday, I will be very upset, he's one of two, the other one is my uh, School and in church, I grew up in Canoga Park, California. Pastor Tim Rasmussen says the same thing. And so those are the only two people I ever contact, right? I mean, I'm not the preacher who goes, hey, brother, just wanted to let you know I'm passing through. You know, that's, that's evangelists speak for, hey, can I get up in front of your people and get a love offering? Uh, so, so I don't do that. But Bradley has been one through these years to say that. And we are delighted uh, to, to always catch up again. He and Megan are sweet people. I'm surprised he doesn't remember. Tiffany acquired a unique characteristic of her father. Uh, you know, when it was like, oh, Tab's singing and Tim's singing. Why isn't Tiffany? Because Tiffany's a lot like her dad, all right? Um, Bradley Moffitt and Rachel, now Azarello, um, are the only two piano players in the history of my life who can find out what key or tone I sing in, okay? Now, Unless you're a musician, I don't know if you'll truly understand this, but honey, I think Rachel explained it. She just, when I start leading a chorus or a song, she kind of picks between whatever key she thinks I'm in, and then she finds out I'm like in between two of them, and then she can play along with me. And she did that for us when we were in California, and Bradley did it for the few summers we were together at Triple S. I would just be like, how can we not play? And he's like, I don't know where you are yet. Just keep singing. And, uh, <clears throat> and he'd finally find where I was, and it'd be great until I threw in, unbeknownst to even myself, some key change or something. And then I'd just hear poor Bradley over there just searching, right? Well, what? What key is that, you know? So, uh, but anyway, so Tiffany, I love you, sweetie. You did a great job on the art show, I will say that, all right? And uh, but thank you, Tim and Tab, for singing as well. And our dear friends with us, the Birchfields. Uh, I'll speak more about them probably in a little bit uh, as we get going here. Good to meet Doug Collins. And as we were chatting beforehand and meeting, I said, I know a Doug Collins. Now, I, I was, le he, he went to Georgia, and uh, Mr. Collins there. I was thinking former NBA player, former NBA coach, analyst, Doug Collins, and he went straight to the political field, and that's where the conversation ended for us because he was way over my head. But it was good to meet you, and uh, I'm excited about you joining the church here soon, and, and uh, I just can't wait. In fact, you may be joining on what we're going to call Double Tithe Sunday on your first week. So just... <laughs> Just give it all, brother, okay? And Bradley hasn't explained that yet, but he asked me to say that from the pulpit for him. And uh, no, good to see you. 
And uh, the Smiths, uh, well, half of the Smith family is here, right? Your husband's recovering from surgery. Please greet him for me. And some of you all, I remember faces from last time we were here. It's good to see it. And, and again, good to see so many new folks. Uh, if you're thinking about joining a church, stop. Th- this is a good one. This is a good one to join where their desire and heart is to see you grow in the Lord. And uh, if you're in the midst of visiting several in the area, keep doing it. But trust me, this is the one you should be a part of. Bradley and Megan are a sweet couple. He's got a pastor's heart. And that's one thing you can't teach in a college setting. And he already had that, a desire to help people. And that's what he wants to do here. So, all right, have I given you enough time to find the book of Philippians? All right, (laughs) Philippians chapter number three. We'll start in verse number seven, and uh, to make sure I save myself from future accusations from my kids, I need to put these on so we're reading the same thing, all right? I don't want to skip it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 says this, but, the things, uh, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now, we'll continue in verse 9 in just a second. But understanding Paul is in prison at this time, writing back to a church. He's in Rome, and he's in prison. Uh, He's under the reign of Agrippa, who's thrown him in jail at this time. Agrippa winds up fighting against Mark Antony uh, from Greece in those rows as the world power switches over in just a little bit. And Paul writes back to an area several thousand miles away uh, in Greece while he's in Rome just to, hey, let, let me write this letter to you folks. I was with you a few years ago and we, we gave you the gospel and I wanted... And as he's in prison, the whole premise of the book of Philippians is beautiful, if you understand this concept, is he's reminding them of the importance of not the circumstances around you, but the Christ that is within you that can help you regardless of the circumstances around you. And so as we see in these first few verses in context as we're looking at here, and we'll continue reading, he's saying, man... All these externals, I count them but loss. It's not that important. What got me through wasn't my external things around me, but who was inside of me to lead God and direct me. So as this letter is now in the third chapter here, let's look at verse 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect or or complete, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend for that Uh, apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of of God in Christ Jesus. And he closes this section by saying this, let us therefore as many as be perfect or complete be thus minded. And if in anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it even this unto you. He says, let's be minded. Let's think this way about the Christ within us, not the circumstances around us. And and if you're not of this mindset, my prayer for you is that God will reveal that way of thinking for you. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule Let us mind the same thing. We're going to look here at what I believe is a twofold goal that the Apostle Paul gives the people in Philippi here, just in these few verses, and we could probably summarize it for the whole book if we wanted to, but if you had some other thought of it and wanted to argue that statement, I'd let you have it. That's fine. This isn't a hill I'm going to die on. 
But there's something I believe Paul clearly gives to us to state here, and we'll look at it this morning. Father in heaven, the scripture is alive, it's quick, it's powerful. And so I pray, as Paul said, I do not frustrate the gospel for your sakes. I have thoughts and I have ideas, but I pray they will never overshadow the principles that are clearly seen. And for those that may not be as easily revealed, may we shed light on it this morning to help us see it, hear it, apply it, and live by it. This is my prayer, and I ask these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. If you all remember a book, it's been made a movie as well. That's where I saw it because I'm not a tremendous reader. But Alice in Wonderland. How many of you are familiar with Alice in Wonderland? All right. You may lower your hands. I don't think it's made the cancel culture list yet, but I'm sure at some point it may. Alice, it's coming. It's coming. Alice falls down the rabbit hole and starts to try to find her way out through a myriad of different things that come her way and obstacles. And uh, then she gets to what I believe is the most demonic thing I've seen as a little kid, that Cheshire cat. All you see is that, you know, that, that you hear it first. You hear that little singing he does. Then you see that big smile. All you see are his teeth that show up out of nowhere. Then those, then those nasty-looking, scary eyeballs show up, and he's just there to taunt Alice. Alice gets to a fork in the road where there's 24 different signs I can remember seeing, and the Cheshire cat is there kind of egging her on, and she stops to ask for directions and says, Sir, which path should I take? And the Cheshire cat says, well, where is it that you want to go? And she says, I'm not really certain. And his response says, then I guess it doesn't matter. If you don't know where you want to get, it doesn't matter which way you take. And so this morning, I want to see this. Dr. Eric Kiev said this, the establishment of a goal is the key to successful living. And this isn't a a, a 10 steps to self-help, this and that, how to achieve success and come to my seminar, this and that. But but it is what I think Paul shows us here, a two-fold goal reminding the folks back in Philippi to stay on course, to don't get your things uh, disarrayed, but to stay and keep the goal in focus. What is the two-fold goal? Paul shows us here in verse number 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. I think the twofold goal is this. The goal in life, folks, don't ever forget. As I sit in a prison cell, I want to send back to you to remind you the great goal in life, the answer to everything. Why are we here? The goal in life is to know Christ, that I may know him. John 17, 3 restates it by saying this, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Christ was not sent so we could have a celebration of just Christmas. Christ was not sent so we could celebrate in just a few weeks Easter and the resurrection, there was a reason Christ came. He didn't come to solve the political scene because Rome was in power when he came and Rome was in power when he left. He didn't come to set the social scene and uh, he didn't come for any other reason except this, for the Son of Man was come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to be born, he came to live, and he came with a purpose to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And as a result of that, it's available to all of us that we can know him. We can know him. You see, the goal in life is not just happiness. And you're looking at a guy who loves to enjoy life, right? And uh, I think you ought to endure it, right? Uh, we have a number at the beginning of our life on a headstone. We have a number at the end of the life uh, on our headstone. And the dash is where the happiness can take place. We only got that little bit of time, so might as well make it fun, might as well make it exciting, and, and still stay out of jail, right? Now, I'm not saying go too far, but, but, but it's more than just happiness. 
this. It's more than just climbing the ladder of success. Although I do believe in the principle that whatsoever your hand find it to do, do it with all your might. And if it's available to gain, then it's available to get. And it doesn't take you away from family and it doesn't take away from purposes that you have been revealed in your life to go after, then go after it. But it's more than just happiness. It's more than just success. It's more than just integrity. It's more than just money. It's more than just social standing and how many friends and how many followers and how many connections we make. You ever see that bumper sticker? I remember as a kid, it was on a lot of the most, I don't know, run down vehicles in the neighborhood, right? And on the back of it was always a bumper sticker that said something like this. He who dies with the most toys wins. And I'm thinking, bro, you're on the bottom rung of that if that's the goal in life. <laughs> now, I know you're not going to put it on the back of a Cadillac. You're not going to put that bumper. But then I, as I got older, here's my, here's my question for that bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. Wins what? What is it that you're going to achieve by having the most toys, right? Now, I understand there's a market out there for Beanie Babies, and you're thinking, if I saved enough Beanie Babies and got this, or if I had this one Pokemon card, or these Hot Wheels are vintage, and if I make sure they're in the package, boy, that toy could be And I, but, but there's, but what do you win? Other than a spouse who's probably on your back all the time, when are you going to get rid of that junk? Here's a... Here's a better bumper sticker I like seeing. It says, N-O, no Christ, N-O, no Christ, no life. Then it has a period and another statement after that, K-N-O-W, no Christ, no life. That has a definite understanding for me. No Christ, no life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. You really don't know life until you know Christ. And so when you see here, the goal in life is not our hedge funds. It's not our bank account. It's not the connections we just make just for sake of saying, I've got all these friends everywhere, and I can say all them when I'm in this area and call them. It's about knowing Christ. I'm not against all that, all right? Um, uh, go get as many degrees as you can get and achieve them and hang them on the wall of your office. Go plant a tree and make a lasting impact for the environment to follow. When you're dead and gone, that you're still helping with all that. But I'm saying, do not leave this world without knowing Christ as your personal Savior. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I mean, I mean we, we, you know, 80% of you were finishing that verse with me. You know what the verse says, but knowing about God and knowing God are two different things. I'm not up here to get anybody to doubt a salvation by any stretch of the imagination. But I am up here to say this. Do you know God? Well, I could tell you when I was in Sunday school and the stories of David and Goliath. Yeah. Do you, sir, do you, ma'am, know God? as your personal savior. He was more than just a good man. He was more than just a historical figure. He was our savior who came to this world, who took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He went to the cross. Do you know God? Wow, Paul, here you are in prison. And one of the main things at the forefront of your mind is not, when am I going to post bail? (laughs) Wasn't, do any of you have any money you can send over here to get me out? Paul's concern was, do you guys know Christ? The twofold goal that I see Paul given here is that the goal in life is to know Christ. 
But just knowing Christ is not the end. If it was, why are we still here for those who've trusted Christ as our personal Savior? Right? If we were in control, we'd be like, okay, you trust me as your Savior? Come on up. Why would he leave us here? Well, he kind of explained it at the end of the book of Matthew and all through the book of Acts. He says, I want you to go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. About what? About me. About me. You see, if the truth were to be told, we're going to ask you, how did you find out about God? 95% of us would say, there was this one person. For some, it was your mama. For some, it was your dad. For some, it was some uncle. For some, it was that nana who would not stop bothering me and kept telling me, I'm praying for you, and I'd go do and live my life, and I'd always hear, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. Uh, just, there's always a person it's directed to. And that person obeyed that command in Matthew when God said go. So the goal in life is that we might know God. But then after that, what is it? We continue reading in this verse. It says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to say this. The goal in the Christian life is to be like Christ. Once we're saved, the goal is to know him so we can go to heaven when we die. Well, then what do I do now? Now I want to be like Christ. I want to be conformed into the image of God. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I want to look like Jesus. There are some attributes that I will never be able to attain to. I will never be omnipotent. I will never be omniscient. I will never be all these things that are unique only to God. But as you mentioned, Brother Bradley, there are some that I can attain to. These fruits of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, the long-suffering, temperance, meekness, all those things are things, and those are what we want to add to our lives so we can be like Christ. So the goal of life is that I may know him. The goal of, uh, of a Christian after we, be, we know him is to be like Christ. How do we do that? Number one, through the power of his resurrection. Romans 4.25, let me read these for you. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. 1 Corinthians 15.17, and if Christ be not raised... Your faith is in vain. You're yet in your own sins. What's the difference between this religion, that religion, this religion, this religion, that religion? I mean, they're all kind of the same, right? They might be similar, but the difference is up from the grave he arose. <laughs> With a mighty triumph or his foes. Uh, just a small little difference. Buddha's still in the grave. Just a small little difference. I mean, we can look and say, but man, there was a stone that rolled away and he is no longer there. And why seek ye the living among the dead? Now, listen to me. How did that happen? Was it sorcery? Was it magic? Was it just, you know, mirrors and smoke? And was it distraction? Were we like, hey, hey all these disciples go in the upper room and all the Jews are surrounding the room there. And while they're doing that, four other Jews snuck over and got them out. And so it was all distraction. No, 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 no. I'll tell you how it was. It was power. Our friends, as we've been together, they've been joking with one of my girls who's a little bit dramatic with the word literally. But I want to read that, uh, read this statement to you so we can understand about the power. The power of the divine spirit which raised him from a literal death is the same which raises believers from a spiritual death now and from a literal death later. We too will be resurrected, not because of magic, sorcery, but because of that same power that's available to all of us. Now, when I was in, let, let's talk about 
this power that I think is an untapped resources for Christians. I don't think we really understand what's available to us. When I was in high school, remember when you became seniors and there was that part of the parking lot where the seniors parked all their cars, right? And I remember going into school and uh, Jack Holt uh, had a Toyota 4Runner, hard top convertible, lived in California, so it was really never wrong because it's California, right? And then next to Jack was, um, uh, uh, let's see, Jack, and then Bob Bowen. Bob Bowen had the, this is 1989, right? So he had that Chevy Camaro, the RS, the, 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 the 5.0 rally sport, right? And it was black. And then next to him was Mark Irabirn. Mark had the Mustang, Brother Bobby, 5.0, and he parked it right next to Bob Bowen. And then Brian Berry came in. Brian had the IROC Camaro, the 5.7 liter, and he parked that down. That had the T-tops on it. And then I came in. <laughs> I had the vehicle that you heard before you saw, but it wasn't because I had straight pipes on the car, trust me. It's because I had two 15-inch subwoofers in the back of my 1972 Datsun wagon. <laughs> Four-speed, power windows. They'd all park right there, and I'd come right in, wrap it around that corner, blooming my speakers, and they're showing off the cars, and I'm showing out my car, right? Windows all down, parked right in there. Man, I can't believe you parked right next to them. What did you think? I didn't care. I bought my car with all $480 I had. And that was my car. And we'd go up to DeSoto Avenue, past Devonshire, maybe on a late Friday night, Saturday night, after we were just being stupid teenagers, right? And then they'd want to race. I just went to watch because I knew I wasn't going to race anybody. But, man, they'd, they, they, they'd open those hoods and they'd talk. And I'd just sit there and it was, I have no idea what they're talking about. And then they'd start, Whoa. I remember, uh, and now that they're here, uh, my friend John here, the, it was probably 10 years ago, I was flying out to do a meeting in Hawaii. Doesn't that sound nice right about now? And um, we hadn't seen each other. We just moved, and I called and said, John, is there any way if I could kind of get a layover in San Jose? Maybe we could spend the day together or something, and then I'll just continue on my flight. And we worked it out. And I remember going, now, John, um, I'll just be on the corner. Don't worry about parking. What vehicle do I look for for you? And he just says, oh, you'll know it's me. I was like, what are you driving these days? I think I, think I asked, well, is it that BMW, that white BMW? And I think you just upgraded. And, um, and uh, so, so he said, okay. Yeah. And uh, finally, man, it just I could just hear that rumble that come around of all these cars here. And I kind of, I just assumed, I just waved, and boom, the windows came down. And John was in the driver's seat, and his son Jordan was in the back seat. Jordan, I don't forgot, but Jordan was knee to grasshopper, right? That's how we say it in North Carolina. And uh, good in, and, and I, I couldn't even tell what type of car it was. It was some sports package. Now, again, John, please, please, I know for any gearhead, this is so disrespectful. But I have no idea, so I'm not disrespectful because I know it was, I'm guessing it was, was it a BMW M3? Is that a, oh, I apologize. Oh, man, it was an M6. Okay. Um, I cannot tell you how many liters the engine is, how much torque at so many RPMs it is, zero to 60. He probably could, because I remember this. I just know the types of cars he drives, right? We got in, and we started zooming around, and we're heading to his house. And then Jordan, his son, said these words. He says, Daddy, can we take him to the stop sign? <laughs> and then John got about as excited as his son Jordan in the back seat. And I was thinking, what in the world is the stop sign? Evidently, I don't remember, again, I can't tell you where, but there's some street close on the way to the house. And um, my ignorance is showing here, I know that. We get to this stop sign, 
And Bradley, he proceeds to put all the windows down. All four windows go down. And he hits some button, Brother Bobby, on the car. And the car just went, it kind, of, it kind of, it felt like it just sat down a little bit more. And I was just thinking, John, what in the world? We were gone, man. And I was, and I kind of, when I'm this way, I can look out of my peripheral and I'm looking back at Jordan just like, Then we slowed down, and, you know, John's just kind of cool because he's John, right? You know, I'm sitting there, like, I, I was like, did we just go through a wormhole? Are we in a different decade? Did we hit 1.21 gigawatts, right? That's what I'm trying to figure out. And uh, then Jordan said, do it again. And I'm kind of like, I don't know. Let me put my seatbelt on, okay, at least. And, uh, man, and so now John is now, this is the new M6 sports package, blah, 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 blah. And he has given me every spec, detail, horsepower. But to me, it sounds like the teacher from Peanuts. Wah, 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 wah. And I'm just going, uh-huh, cool, yeah, great, yeah, good, good. The power of that vehicle was incredible. And then he said these words, Bradley. You want to drive? You know what I said? Nope. <laughs> Here's my first initial reaction. <laughs> Tree. <laughs> Cross the double yellow line. You know what? I, I didn't, I'm not ready for that power. And can I tell you, I think there's a lot of Christians out there, spiritually speaking, who have no idea of a power that's available to you. You think you need power to stand up and do Acts chapter 2 things and proclaim to thousands of people standing around Solomon's porch and give them the gospel and so many people wind up being added to the Lord there. But what you're misunderstanding is that same power that not only resurrects the Christ, uh, resurrects Christ, that same power that can indwell someone to preach the gospel unashamedly is the same power that can help you overcome your stress is the same power that can give you wisdom in areas with which you need to make decisions and you just don't know if you can do it. That same power is not just for resurrecting the dead and giving the gospel. It's for everyday life that's available to all of us. And I feel too many Christians are just like, nah, I don't know about that. Uh, that's a little bit too, no, I'm, I just, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> And we have an untapped resource of spiritual indwellment that is available that we just kind of get scared. Well, I'm afraid I, I ain't like those other churches where I stand up and they're filled with the Spirit. And blah, 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 blah. That is the furthest thing from being filled with the Spirit. Paul said, I'd rather speak five words in a known tongue than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. And if the tongues was the, pro what was the filling of the Spirit, then how come Peter preached in Greek the rest of the chapter after that took place? Being filled with the Spirit is being endued with a power of someone who knows exactly what's best and in your interest. You think you want to do this because that would give you satisfaction. And God says, man, you're so way off. If you'll let me lead God and direct you, I'll point you the way that's going to lead you to the destination that's going to give you the ultimate satisfaction that you need. I'm your heavenly father. I know what you need. And any parent in here understands that principle. The power of his resurrection. Secondly, I see the fellowship of his sufferings. And he that taketh not his cross, and follows after me is not worthy of me. The $64,000 question has never been, will Christ identify with me? It has always been, will we identify with Christ? And it was so perfectly illustrated in the life of Peter. At a time in which he could have identified and shown like never before, three times he says, I know not the man. I know not the man. I know not the man. And when that cock crew over here, he said, I did not identify with Christ the way I should have. 
missed opportunities. Nobody likes a fair weather fan. It's amazing how many Tampa Bay Buccaneer fans showed up on planet Earth in the last 12 months, isn't it? I get made fun of a lot because I'm Clint Fredericks and because I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Oh, okay. Altar will be open and we'll come celebrate our 27 years of missed postseasons and not one win. The Dodgers haven't won anything since 1988. Praise God we got one last year, but up until then. You know, hey, but you know what? I'm not a fan based on their results. I'm a fan because I identify with them. And I'm not a Christian going, what's the weather like today? Is it okay to be a Christian or do I need to be silent about this? I'm a Christian because Christ died for my sins and I'm a child of God. And I can't separate being a Christian. I can't separate Christ from being a Christian. <laughs> As we sing in junior church, I am a C, I am a C-H, I am a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. You can't spell Christian without Christ. So how can you be a Christian without Christ? I identify with Christ and it seems that we identify most with him in the fellowships of suffering. You know when it's all green lights on the way to work and the fast food place gets my order right and we just start to think, man, I must be doing pretty good. Well, we say it that way, I must be doing pretty good. But then when it's every red light, the tire gets blown out, your gas gauge broke, and now you're on the side of the road. Then it's this. I wonder what God's trying to teach me. As if God wasn't trying to teach you anything on the good days. But when it's a good day, it's all us. When it's a bad day is when we now identify and say, this, is, this must, you know, I'm, I'm, I got to get my alternator fixed. This must be what Jesus felt when he was on the cross. <laughs> got to be kidding me. But it is in moments of suffering, though, I can say this, that we do realize, well, I guess I've used all options. God, when that should be a daily response, not just during the sufferings. God blessed us with some friends over here, the Birchfields. I don't know how long we had known each other, John, but I can I see it sometimes, and you know the exact date. You probably know what day of the week when Lexi was rushed to the hospital. And I remember Jake Spears and myself, we drove over to the hospital because our friends had a need. And we got up to the floor, and remember when those elevators opened, and it was a long hallway, and we just made eye contact. Jake and I walked out and made eye contact with John. At the time, she, we didn't know uh, she was going to be diabetic now and all this and that, type, uh, type 1 diabetes. How old was she at the time? Five years old. So until we got that diagnosis and knew that, it was, we don't know, sir, we're trying everything. But when we walked down that hallway and I embraced John, that was much different than the normal handshakes we had. It was during that suffering that God gave us a friendship. I wish it was a different avenue, but God seems to make it clear that it's in suffering that you find out who your true friends are. I would not wish any suffering on anyone unless I knew it would draw them closer to Christ. You're a pastor. We would never pray for things like that but I have often prayed that if my funeral is what it took for my dad to get saved I'm okay with that if my funeral is what it took for Uncle Buddy and Auntie Carolyn and my cousin Eugene and Leslie and Amanda, to trust Christ, I'm okay with that. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowships of his suffering. Any parent knows this. If I could rescue my child from pain and hurt, give it to me. Christ did just that for all of us. He said, I don't want them to go to hell. And I want them to understand the fellowship of suffering. And then lastly, it says this, and we need to finish. I'm sorry for going so long. We see the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable unto his death. Well, how long do we do this for, preacher? <laughs> Till the trumpet sounds? Or till they're reading about us in the obituaries? It's not, well, if I do this for 15 weeks, being conformable unto death, continuing faithfully until our literal death, continuing daily in the death of self. As we fight the flesh, we must kill the flesh every day and be led by the Spirit, we do it. The same type of temptations that Christ faced, we face. And he tells us we can overcome them. How? It is written. It is written. It is written the same way Christ did. When Satan came to tempt him three times, he said, man, turn these stones into bread. Man, cast thyself down. Man, fall down and worship. Every answer Christ gave him was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. And what happens is when temptation comes to us, here's what we do. We lean into our own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. We need to make sure that we can kill the flesh and, and be dead to the flesh until the day we literally die. I'm done. On a wall outside the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, there's a portrait. It states this, the inscription under it. James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembles his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for their freedom. No literal portrait of Christ exists today either. But the likeness of his son, who makes us free, can be seen in the lives of his true followers. The goal in life that I may know him. All right, I've done that. Now the goal in your Christian life is to be conformed into the image of his son. How do I do that? Through the power of his resurrection, justification. How do I do that? By the fellowship of his sufferings, identification. How do I do that? Being made conformable unto his death, continuation. May these words be uh, uh, words that identify us who claim the name of Christ who say that we are more than just believers, we are followers, we are disciples of Christ. Let's live like it. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word of God that is left for us to lead God and direct us. I pray, God, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know the answer to life, which is that I may know him, may they trust you as a personal savior. And for those of us who are saved and on our way to heaven, but that's all we are. We're, we've got our fire insurance and we're not going to hell, but maybe we've not grown to be the Christian that you have fit for us. May we understand that we need to daily try our best to be conformed into the image of your son. I pray that you would help us to realize there's an untapped resource of power available to us. And God, then I pray you would help us to realize that in those times of sufferings that you're wanting to fellowship with us like never before. And then, God, may we do this all the days of our life that you give to us. 
and be an example to those around us of what a follower of Christ should be. Help us now is my prayer. Our heads about to rise to close. Is there anybody here this morning that you've not taken care of that ultimate goal in life, that you may know him? And if you're here this morning and don't know for sure where you would spend eternity, can I tell you there's a place called heaven that Jesus Christ died on the cross for, wanting everybody to go there. The sad part is not everyone will. Why? Because man has a choice, and some choose to reject him. That's why hell has been enlarged. Isaiah teaches us, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth, and that without measure. Because some people have rejected Christ. And because of that, the, the hell that was created for the devil and his angels, spoken of three times in the Gospels, uh, has had to get bigger because unthinkably some people rejected Christ and said, you know what, I'll do what I think is best. If you're here this morning and don't know for certain that Christ is your personal Savior, can I say you can know him today? Get that taken care of. And then Christian, if you're here, let's make sure we're doing all we can to be conformed into the image of his son. Father in heaven, I pray you be with these next few moments. I'll turn it over to Brother Bradley. And Lord, help us that are here this morning to be having our eyes opened unto the truth that you are there. You're there with unlimited power to lead, guide, and direct us. And may we jump into that and allow you to do that in our lives. If there's one here who knows not for certain where they'd spend eternity, I pray you'd move upon them to make a decision. And let's get that taken care of this morning. Our heads about to rise to close. Brother Bradley, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brother Doug. What a great song this morning. The power that God gives us, the Holy Spirit inside of our lives. You know, I was thinking as he was talking about that power that God gives, and he likened it to the sports car. Is there anybody here who would have such speed and horsepower in a car that wouldn't use it? They use it often. But we as Christians have the Holy Spirit living in our lives. And how often do we reject his help on a daily basis? What did Paul say? That daily I crucify the flesh and I die to myself every single day. Yet we as Christians are content to live our Christianity out here in church on Sunday. And through the week we reject the power that God gives us. And then when suffering comes, we raise our hands and think, how am I going to handle this? We look at Paul and we think, how did Paul handle such suffering? Through the power the Holy Spirit gives him. That's how we handle it. We're going to have an altar call here in just a minute. If you're not saved, there are people here who would love to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. So show you how you can have the power the Holy Spirit gives. If you're a Christian here, maybe it's time to take some time this morning to pray and just trust the Holy Spirit living inside of us a little bit more each day. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the great sermon we've heard. Bless this time of invitation now in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. The altars are open here this morning. If you have already come to pray, the altars are open here this morning if you'd like to send prayer. Asking God to help us on a daily basis as we confront our suffering, as we confront the issues of life, that we would use the power that God gives. The altars are open here this morning. To Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Brother Fred, that was wonderful. I hope you enjoyed that as I did and was blessed and learned something. I hope you take one thing home from that sermon because uh, I think I'm going to take several things home today. That was wonderful. Thank you, Brother Fred.
and for being such a great grace to get our uh, sermon this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Once again, Bezzer, we thank you so much uh, for taking the time to, uh, to, to come here, Brother Fred, taking the time to come speak to us. We really appreciate that. Just a few reminders, we do have life groups during the week, Wednesday at 5 o'clock for uh, dinner and 6 o'clock for class, and then our uh, parenting class that goes on at 6.30 on Thursday. So that is still going on this week, and uh, so keep those in mind also. Bike Sunday this coming up, please be a part of that, and that will be a, uh, just, just a great Sunday to keep that in mind. Once again, thank you so much for being here this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you for those who came out last Friday, this past Friday night, to Grace Baptist and helped with the, the Bible putting together and packing. That was a, a lot of fun. Thank you for those who came out. And with that, once again, thank you so much for being here. You're dismissed. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you back tonight for discipleship class at 5 o'clock.